Let's get started. So, uh, what is happening next week? Uh, looks like a test, although the... <laughs> okay, the board went out. And Okay, great. So, uh, what else is happening next week? What is due next week? The assignment's due when? Monday, and when's the lab now due? Tuesday, great. So you guys have been seeing the announcements, so that's good. Uh, when's the midterm number one? Friday, great, awesome. So um, I'm not exactly sure what's going to be on the test, so what will happen is whatever we get through on Wednesday, that's going to be what's on the test from the beginning of the semester until whatever we do on Wednesday. It's not necessarily the same as this. I'm going to upload this on the course site uh, when we get closer to Wednesday, just so that we get uh, uh, a comprehensive list and uh, an accurate list. So it'll definitely have the things from chapter one and two. So remember chapter one was, how does a computer work? What are the main parts of it? Uh, how do you work with programs on a high level? Uh, things like that. Uh, chapter two was uh, quite a long, quite a bit longer, and it was more about how does C++ work on a high level. So, what are the main moving parts of them? Uh, what are identifiers, literals? What is C out? What are preprocessor directives? The main data types like ints and floats and doubles, the char data type, string, bool. Uh, and then some other things, uh, like scope, comments, operators, that sort of thing. And then chapter four stuff, we haven't done very much of that, but I hope to get through chapter four by Wednesday. So relational operators, we're go we I went over that last time. Uh, if and else statements, I kind of went over that last time, and I'm gonna go over that again a little bit today. Uh, and all of the other ones we haven't done yet. So the format of the test will be uh, 20 multiple choice questions at three points each and two programming questions. So they'll be kind of like the ones on the assignment. So I present you a problem. Uh, you want to ask the user for these bits of data and then you have to do some calculation and then output the result. Okay, so uh, pretty straightforward. Any questions about the, yeah. Yeah, you'll be writing in code, of course. Yeah. And, uh, where can we find this page? So this is not uploaded yet, purely because I don't know if I'll be able to get to these last bits in chapter four. But as as we get closer, uh, I will get I will upload this with a more accurate representation of what will happen. Chapter one and two will definitely be on the test because we're finished with them. Uh, and of course, the first two we've already done, so those two will be on there. But as for the rest, I'm not sure yet. Any other questions about the test itself? When's the test? Friday. Friday. Great. In, yeah. At home or in here? What do you think? Here, here, because I have that seating chart on Blackboard, and it's for this room. Yep. In the back. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, that's the definition of unsigned. There's uh, no sign to the number. So signed can go into the negatives, uh, but unsigned is either zero or positive. It's never negative. Uh, well, zero is, is an unsigned integer. Yeah. So every unsigned range has a minimum of zero. I didn't hear the first part. I didn't hear the first part. Can you relate that to calculus? Relate that to? I'm not sure what you mean relate it to calculus. Yeah, I'm not sure what that means. But. Uh, we can talk offline. Uh, other questions in general? 
So assignment three will go out on Monday. Uh, I haven't finished making it yet. Okay, so we've been talking about these decisions. Uh, so what's the point of having decisions in our code? Not a rhetorical question. Yeah. Right, so if I want to execute some code but only based on some condition that happens, maybe the user enters some value, then I want to check if some condition is true, then I can execute that code. I don't want to just have a program that's completely straight through and uh, doesn't make any decisions whatsoever. So the entire point of this is to have conditional code execution. So in order to actually uh, check whether a condition is true, one way you can do that is with relational operators. So I want to compare some value against some other value. And then that'll give me a true or false answer that will allow me to say, yeah, if this condition is true, I compared x against 5, and x happens to be larger than 5, then I'll execute this code. But if it happens to be that x is not larger than 5, then I won't execute that code. So uh, we saw some uh, relational stuff. So remember, we're always going to be dealing with true and false here because an expression is either true or it is false. And then we'll execute code whether or not the condition that we check is true. So, and of course we can assign the expression itself to a Boolean variable if we want to use it in, in some other types of calculations. So uh, the hierarchy I kind of went over last time is what of the relational operators are looked at first. The ones that are highest precedence are checked first, and then the ones of lowest precedence are checked uh, second. So we talked a little bit about this if statement thing, which is if something in this parentheses, this condition is true, then we execute the code that's within the if statement i.e. within the curly brackets corresponding to that if statement. So if this condition evaluates to true, then we will execute these statements within the curly brackets. If condition is not true, then we won't execute those uh, statements. So pretty straightforward. If you want a, uh, a diagram, uh, 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 what do we call these? Flowchart, thank you. Uh, my mind went astray for a second. So for this flow chart, if you look at the condition, it either is true or false, then we either skip over the statements in the case that it's false, or go through the statements in the case that it's true. So if we have some examples like these, if we have some variable called score, and we are checking that it's at least 60, then if it happens to be the case that it is at least 60, then we'll execute the code inside the if statement, which happens to be this one line right here. See out this thing, and then we'll print you past if it happens to be that score is at least 60. If score is at least 90, then we'll execute these, uh, these two statements here. So we'll set some variable to some value. It doesn't necessarily have to print something, and then we'll print this as well. So uh, uh, let me ask you a question. So let's say that we had this situation here. So I kind of copied uh, that example slightly modified. So I have this if statement here. I, I print uh, A, that's the score you got. Maybe we'll put it on a new line for the next statement. And then we'll print uh, another statement. So uh, what will happen? So let's ignore this uh, four lines on the bottom. So what do you think will happen if I enter 90 here? So the the condition will definitely be true, but what will be printed? Well, let's see. Uh, it'll definitely print A. Will it print this? Yes. So let's just see what happens. So it, and it prints both. But now let me ask you another question. What if I enter 80? Well, the condition is false. So will I print A here? No, because it's in the if statement. What about this one? 
Yes, I will print it. Why? I don't have the curly braces. So if you don't have curly braces, only the next statement will be in the if statement. So if we run this, it will print good jo a great job in this case. So in some languages like Python, um, this indentation actually does matter. It looks like this second C out is in the if statement, but in fact it is not. So in some languages it does matter. In C++, it does not matter. Indentation doesn't count. I need to put curly brackets around the, if st uh, the two statements that I want. Then, if I try to put ADN, then it won't print anything. So, uh, just be careful of this. My uh, rule of thumb is to always put curly braces, even if you have only one thing there. So, you're guaranteed to never make a mistake if you have curly brackets around the code that you want to actually execute. Okay, any questions on that? Yeah. So if you, if you put a curly brace like after the A, would it just print A if you put a curly brace? So you mean a close one right here? Yeah. Yeah, so that's effectively the same situation as we had before, but now I put curly braces in. So note here, the if statement corresponds to these curly braces. So when this one ends, this C out, this second one, effectively is, I might as well just de-indent it back out of the, out of here. So it might as well just look like, okay, so it's not playing nice with me, but it might as well be indented back. Yeah, so uh, my, another rule of thumb is to put uh, a curly brace right after the if statement uh, on the same line, and then the close one uh, way below the if statement where the, uh, the if statement actually is at the same level. So I know that this curly brace right here corresponds to the if statement because I can just look up and see it. Um, but there's nothing wrong with doing it in a different style. Okay, any other questions about this? Okay, so just uh, that's a few examples. If is, if is, oh, go ahead, sorry. What is end one? Oh, you mean end L. So what does end L do? And, uh, so what does it actually do for C out? It prints a new line, effectively, yeah. It does other things, but we're not there yet. Okay, so if itself is a C++ keyword. So remember, keywords are things that have a special meaning in C++, if is another one of the keywords. Uh, for the condition, you must put parentheses around them. In some languages, you can. Some, you can't. C++, you actually can't. Uh, it says, do not place a semicolon after where the condition is. What if I did? I like breaking all the rules. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it sounds like um, it'll stop the if statement. What if I did this? Before I hover over that error, what do you think it's, it's going to say in English? I actually don't know what it's going to say, but what do you think it should say? Yeah. Well, remember when we had the case of the one statement below the if statement, we didn't have to have curly braces. So I don't have to. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Uh, if statement has empty body. So think of this. So I s look at this line right here where I have one semicolon. What if I put two semicolons? Is that okay? So uh, will it compile and run? Let's just see. I'll remove the one I had before. So if I enter 90, it, it seems like it executes just fine. So in fact, what happened here is that Right here is what is called an empty statement. So a statement doesn't necessarily have to have like an operation that happens. It could be, in fact, empty. So what happens here is the if statement is looking for the next statement in the C++ program. Well, in this case, it happens to be an empty statement. So if scores at least 90, do nothing. And then, well, 
what if I just did this? So if I run this and I enter 90, it'll, it seems like it works just fine even with this semicolon there. So what happened here is that you can still have curly braces that don't correspond to anything. So the code we have right now effectively is just this. The if statement is not even there at this point. So here, what happens is when you see a curly brace that doesn't correspond to some condition, then we're going to execute it anyway. So it, it's a way of separating uh, some code from others, but it's still executed like a normal piece of code, like as if we didn't have those curly braces there. But so just be careful of not putting a semicolon after the if statement because that corresponds to an empty statement. Because the if statement right here is looking for the next block of code or, sta or statement of code. So the next statement or block is this open close curly brace bit. Okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so if I had a colon here, a semicolon there, so if we enter 80, it'll still print that. Yeah, because the if statement's effectively doing nothing to our program. Sometimes that's a good thing to have, but in most cases it isn't. Uh, any questions on why that's the case? So if you see something in the slides like this, where it says, do not do this, or do this, without really any explanation, what should you do? Try it out. Try it out. Just work with it a little bit, play around a little bit. That's how you actually understand programming a lot better, is how uh, I uh, publish research. I tinker around with uh, manipulating things in a new way that people haven't. Well, if you look at some ironclad rule that looks like this, uh, is that necessarily true? What are the implications of if I did that? That sort of thing. So if you look at these, uh, just, be, just try to understand why that's there instead of just uh, memorizing it for like a test or something. Okay, yeah. Um, here it says, don't forget the curly braces around a multi-statement body. Why is that there? Well, why should you not forget that? Because if we have a bunch of statements that are indented without the curly braces there, then the if statement could only execute the first one. It'll, never, it'll always execute the other ones because they're not in the if statement even though it looks like it is in the if statement. So I always recommend putting curly braces around if you have multiple statements. In fact, always, but um, here, this is actually kind of important. So don't confuse uh, an assignment with a single equals with a double equals, which is comparison. So here, let's go back here. So if I wanted to check if it, the score is equal to 90, remove this then this will do exactly what we expect. If I enter 90, the statement will be true, and I'll execute the code. If it's not 90, uh, then we won't. What if I did that, and I did an assignment? What do you think will happen? Yeah. Well, well it says we ha we're doing an assignment here, but what will the if statement do? Let's, well, how can I actually check? Run it. Let's just figure out. Maybe I'll be safe and put something that's not 90 just to actually be sure. And it still prints. So what do you think happens? Well, well, score gets 90 here. It's definitely assigning 90 to score. But it still has to evaluate some whether something's true or false. Yeah. But just because it's an assignment, that doesn't mean anything. I entered 85, and, and it still went through. Yeah. Right. I'm not, I'm not explicitly testing anything here. So by default, what do you think the uh, value of the condition in the, true, in the if statement is? True. true. So if you don't have a condition here, or, or, or an explicit condition here. I have to have something there, uh, an assignment or whatever. But if I don't explicitly test for something, the, the by default answer is true. 
Get a question? Okay. Any questions about why that is? Okay, so just remember to put uh, double equals here. So uh, there's something called a Yoda statement, believe it or not. Uh, and the way that, to help mitigate against this single equals versus double equals thing. So w the way that it works is you do the exact same comparison, but in the opposite order. The answer is still the same, but what if I tried to do single equals here? And I tried to compile, what'll happen? I can't assign it. I can't assign a variable to a literal. I can assign something to a variable like in the, if we flipped it back, but here I can't because I'm trying to assign something that uh, cannot be assigned to, a number, uh, a directly a number. So this helps mitigate against typos like that. So I fully advocate Yoda statements. So, uh, although I won't test on that, but um, yeah, it's just to help mitigate against that. Any questions on why this is here? this last bit? Okay, so let's move on to this. Um, if you're working with floats or doubles, uh, you may wanna check if something is equal to some value like 0 0.5 or something. The issue here is that not all numbers are representable by floats or doubles. In fact, of course they have a range that they could represent, but even within the range, there are some values that, for example, like 0 0.1, they cannot represent perfectly accurately. So if you're trying to do a comparison like with equality to some number, then you may have some issues because the chances of it being exactly that value are very slim. So what is recommended instead is to use uh, greater than or equal or less than or equal to test just to be absolutely sure. Um, or another way that some people work, do this is maybe you want to actually test for that value, but you want to have some error just in case if it happens to be not exactly that value, but within 0.01% uh, of that number, then you can do a comparison to see uh, you have a range and say, is it below this max and at least this minimum value? Then you can have to see uh, is it actually close to this given value? But the one that I use most often is use greater than or equal to or less than or equal to. Okay. Um, so this is just um, additional stuff, not really that important. Uh, you could, in fact, represent something that is equal to zero, like an integer is equal to zero. You can consider that as false. And anything that's not zero you can consider that as true. They're interchangeable. So uh, in this um, uh, code we had before, if I just did if score like that, no comparison to any number, uh, what is this if statement checking about score? It, if it's what? Well, uh, score is a double, right? So it's, it doesn't have a true or false value. So what am I really checking? Whether it's not zero. So if I have something, if I enter exactly zero, then it won't do anything. But if I enter 0 0.2, let's see if this works. Yeah, so if you enter anything that's not exactly zero, then uh, the if statement will say true. So you don't have to do a, a comparison and get a true or false value explicitly, you can just work with zero or one or some non-zero value if you wanted to. Yeah, so in, if it's exactly zero, it's false. If it's non-zero, you can consider it true. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be a comparison, like I said. So flags, oh, go ahead, unless you... Good question. I think it'll be true, but let's, so, uh, uh, be like uh, what was uh, just asked. Uh, if you are not sure whether something's true, try it out. So what if we try to enter negative one? It'll still be true. So if it's non-zero, it's true. You had a question? I, I can't hear you. 
Yes. Uh, uh, actually, I don't, I don't know if you can do that. Uh, maybe you can. Let's see. So let's enter zero and see what happens. Yeah. So in fact, you can use, uh, I guess you can use exclamation mark on something that's not a Boolean value directly. Uh, because on the back end, bools are handled exactly the same way as integers are. Uh, but it, it's just when you print them, you get a different result. Uh, other questions? Okay, so let's talk about flags. Uh, not the American flag or, uh, yeah. I don't know why there's only one star there, but anyway. Um, I just used the first one that I saw in my emoji keyboard. But um, flags are kind of useful and actually really useful. So what they are meant to do is... Uh, you perform some calculation and you save it to a Boolean variable, a flag in this case, and then you can uh, work with that Boolean value against some if statements. So here, for example, um, if I wanted to make a bool that corresponds to a person getting at least 90, so if I make a variable like this, at least 90, and then I make the condition that score is at least 90 for that, then I can use this uh, Boolean here. But then I, in this if statement, the flag I could set to be something else if I wanted to. So maybe in this if statement, I can set at least 90 for whatever reason to be false. And then another condition later, uh, if at least 90, then I have some other block of code, right? So flags are really good for when you want to search for something. So for example, we're going to be working with uh, a list of numbers near the end of the semester. So I give you a list of numbers, and I want you to find some value. So maybe let's find 90 in some value in the list of numbers. Then what you do is you start going through the numbers, and if you find uh, that you that 90 is in the list, then you set this flag variable to be true uh, or false, depending on what you want to do. And then after you're done looking, then you want to check, did you actually find uh, 90 in your list? By uh, querying, if you found 90 with this flag variable, then you'll execute some other code. So flags are not really any different handling-wise than Booleans are. But flags are meant to signify, did you find something or is some condition true that you want to actually execute something else? So it's not really that uh, interesting until we get into the next chapter. It's mainly just to uh, save a condition to a variable and then use the variable multiple times at a later point. Yeah, so as an example, so maybe we set some Boolean directly to true. It's, there's no condition there. Then um, maybe some inputted value months here is uh, strictly less than zero. Then maybe we want to uh, model how much we want to pay per month. Or if we're managing employees, how much should I pay them per month? Well, if I enter a number of months that's strictly less than zero, I hope no one's ever worked for negative one months. So uh, this is just for handling purposes if the user entered a bad uh, input. So then if this is true, then this flag variable is set to be false. So by default, I assume that the users entered a true uh, number for the number of months. But if we happen to find that, in fact, the user did not enter something correctly, then we'll set the flag variable accordingly. And then later we'll query, did the user in fact enter the, uh, a valid number of months? Then if so, then I'll in fact check uh, whether or not, uh, th then I'll in fact uh, use all the calculations I need on that assumption that everything worked correctly. By the way, there's a bug in this slide. This is straight from the publisher. So what's the bug in this slide? What if months is equal to zero? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So if months is equal to zero, will I ever set valid months to be false? No. 
So maybe, I, in fact, I do have a condition on the case that they did, in fact, enter exactly zero. But just going off of this, if there's no other if statement, then I'll be dividing by zero here. OK? So um, being able to handle these corner cases are very, very important, and these divide by zero cases. But do you understand how flags work? You just make a Boolean, and then you modify it accordingly depending on whether you're checking for something, and then query later about that, the state of that Boolean variable, whether, in fact, you satisfied all of the possible errors that the user might have put in, that sort of thing. OK. So of course, you can uh, use an integer as well as a Boolean for a flag. So you don't necessarily have to use true and false here. You can just use zero and non-zero, just as I have said before. So it's exactly the same type of thing. Uh, I mentioned this last time. So if and else um, conditions are when you want to test for something to be true, then you execute that block of code. We know how to do that. But the else statement here says, if the condition was false, meaning I don't execute statement set one here, then I will definitely execute statement set two. So let's just see an example. So maybe let's revert this back to here. So if I have an else statement here, then uh, what, what is an example thing that I could print here? <laughs> you can try harder. OK, cool. Fine. The, uh, it's our own application. So what if I entered 92? What should I expect to be printed? Uh, yeah, the stuff in the if statement. What about the one in the else statement? No. So if I have an if and an else, exactly one of those two blocks will be executed. And not both and not neither. So the one that will be executed is this one here. And in fact, we can verify that to be true. And if we entered 89 instead, what do you think will happen? We'll try harder. And that's in fact exactly what we get. Yeah? Is it the same over else if? Uh, great question. We're almost there. Yeah. But any questions on how else works? Yeah? Uh, what do you mean booleans in the if statement? We're not to uh, those operators yet. The like and or yeah, we're not there yet. Yeah. Uh, it depends on what the what you're actually checking along the way. So you could go either way, but you may have to handle something in addition to that. It, it all depends on how the if else chain works. But um, yeah, the if else chain. Uh, well, I'll mention that in a second. So just as a, a diagram, if we have some condition, then we'll split depending on whether the result is true or false and execute the statements accordingly, as you might expect. And then if else works, uh, this is pretty much exactly the example I had earlier. Uh, if you want to use just if with no else, then it may be the case that I execute blo uh, both blocks of the if, but if I have an if else, exactly one of them will be executed. But as I mentioned, and what is in the lab assignment, and partly the reason why I extended the due date, sorry about that, is if I have an if else chain. And so what happens here is if uh, some condition's true, I execute things. Else, then I may need to check some other condition and then execute code. And then maybe. Uh, after that, I have to uh, make another uh, check whether something's true. So maybe let's just say that uh, I want to do the A, B, C, D, and uh, E uh, with the usual cutoffs 90, 80, uh, 70, 60. So I'm going to put this condition back here to make it easier. And then, and then if I want to check here that the score is between 80 and 89, what should I put? Else if, and then what should I be checking for here? 
that it's between 80 and 89. But have we seen any way of checking whether something's true and something else is true? No. So, but will this work? Yeah, why? Well, it, yeah, go ahead. Right. So the top case, uh, I've eliminated all the possibilities where score is at least 90. So when I come down to the LSIF, anything that's at least 90 is already taken care of. So here, all I'm checking for is whether it's at least 80. And implicitly, we're checking whether it's strictly less than 90 as well. So if I entered uh, 85 here, then I'll get exactly what I want. But if I entered 75, what do you think will happen? Nothing, because it failed the second if check as well. So then what we, what we will have to do is we have to copy this and then do one for 70 and one for 60. But what if I wanted to handle the ones that are uh, all less than 60? I'm else, do I need an if? No. Well, in this uh, type of uh, application, I might, because there's no neat reason to have a negative score. But here, uh, let's just assume that we say you failed. And then here, if I enter anything strictly less than 60, then I'll uh, print you failed. So I'll do exactly one of these uh, blocks of code because I have if statements along the way. It can't be the case that two of these uh, blocks will be executed. And it can't be the case that zero of them are executed because I have this catch all case at the bottom. If I omitted that else block at the bottom, I might not execute all of any of the blocks above. Okay, so that's an if else chain. And then the trailing else, uh, we already saw that. It's just a catch all case. Uh, just in, uh, if you have something that's, uh, you have a lot of other cases and you don't want to handle them, just put them in the else block at the end. You can have nested if statements if you wanted to. Uh, uh, this is going to be on your next programming assignment, but uh, not in too much detail here. But just note that if you have an elf if block, you can embed anything inside an if statement. Uh, and nested if statements, uh, just be careful. Please put curly braces on everything uh, because this may seem like this else at the bottom corresponds to this if. Um, uh, it actually does, but it's just, um, it may be hard for a user to actually read this. So always put curly braces on here. Okay, I gotta show, uh, I'll skip over this slide, I'll come back to it on Monday. Uh, or maybe today, depending on how much time we have. So in the lab, you need to check whether something is between uh, at least a certain number and at most another number to be in some range. Well, you need to be able to check whether some condition is true and some other condition is true. But you may also want to check whether some condition is true or some other condition is true. And that's the case of logical operators. So in the second programming assignment, you saw an operator where you had one ampersand or one vertical bar. Here, a double ampersand or a double or corresponds to a logical and. So a logical and corresponds to, I'm checking two conditions or two Boolean values. And I've, if I'm checking whether uh, the and of them is true, then what has to be true of both of them in order for the result to be true of the and of them? So if I uh, do this, so if I look at these examples, so I have a condition here, x at least y, and y at uh, strictly larger than z, and I'm checking and here. So this is saying that, is it the case that 12 is strictly larger than five? Is that true? Is 12 larger than five? I know it's early. Yes, good. 
uh, is 5 strictly larger than negative 4? Yep. So both of the conditions are true, then therefore the result is true. But if we look at the next one, it says that the first condition is true. It's the same one as before. But this condition is false because it's not the case that negative 4 is larger than 5. So we have a true and a false statement. And so, therefore, the result is false because not both of them are true. If one of them is false, or both of them, then the and of them is false. Okay? But if we have an or instead, then if either of them is true, then the or of them is also true. Okay, so it's either this is true or this other condition is also true. Okay, so let's do this uh, earlier example. So suppose that I hate else. I don't want to use else at all. I only can use if statements. So how can I make the same application but with only if statements? So the if at least 91 is okay. Uh, because I don't have an upper bound here, but I need to check between at least 90 and, uh, sorry, at least 80 and strictly less than 90. So what do I need to put here? Yeah. Right. So should I put and or or here? And. Right. And is that one ampersand or two? Two. Good. So then the other condition is score strictly less than 90 then what do you think this condition is going to be? Same thing, almost. Uh, strictly less than 80, then and score less than 70. And then what about the you failed case? So what is the range on that one? So now we have to say what the lower bound is. Okay, so what's the lower bound? Mm -hmm. Less than 60, yeah. So if score at least zero and uh, score strictly less than 60. So now this, is, this was a little bit more effort, right? I needed to actually make specific what the lower bound was in order to get this to work, yeah. Yes, I have to have score a second time because here I need to have something that evaluates to a Boolean thing. In other languages like Python, you do not have to say the variable twice because it's assumed you're going to use the same variable again. But in C++, you have to have something that evaluates to bool. And uh, some variable less than some value always does, yeah. Right, that, that's, that's what I was saying. Uh, some languages permit you to do that. In C++, it doesn't. And in fact, we can even test this. So if we have 70 less than score, less than 80, I wish this worked, but in fact, it doesn't. Oh, hmm. Let's see. So let's try putting... I didn't know that would work. Hmm. Let's see. Oh, okay. Okay. So, ah, I know why. So, why is this true? Always a true expression. So, if I hover over the error, it says that uh, the result of comparison with 80 with something of type bool is always true. Yeah. Well, let's just look at this from left to right. So remember the precedence things, right? So I have to look at the things of highest precedence first, then the things of the lowest precedence. Here, we don't have anything of lowest precedence. Both of them are at the highest precedence. So by default, what order should I look at this if statement? From left to right. So I'm looking at this left to right and saying, oh, 70 less than or equal to score. What does that evaluate to? What type? I don't care if it's 0 or 1, but what type? A Boolean. So by default, what values could a Boolean take on in terms of an integer? 
zero for the case of false, or I said non-zero for true, but what is the default one? One. So it's either the case that it's zero or one, but that is always less than 80, going right throughout the expression. So, yeah, do you got a question? So uh, this is going off a question someone asked. What if I just put score in the middle and I didn't put a double ampersand here? Then uh, what would actually happen? See, this does communicate what you want, but it's not what C++ is actually doing. So because if we look at this, uh, it in fact always evaluates the true, no matter what. So by putting ampersand here, by saying uh, it's true that th it must be the case that this is true and this is true, then it will not always be a true if statement. So always put double ampersands because in C++ that's what it's ex expecting, yeah. One ampersand? Ooh. You guys ask really good questions and I don't know the answer to them. Let's see. Let's see what happens. Let's put a C in here to denote uh, we, we are in this case, in fact. So let's try putting 75. Hmm, let's see. So why is that happening? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's not what I was, yeah, okay. So what's happening here? It's actually something quite deep, yeah. Hmm. So, did I mention that booleans can behave the same way as integers in some way? Yeah. yeah. So, what it, for the 75 inputs, think of 75 input. What does this evaluate to as an integer? One. Or some non-zero value. Uh, let's just think one for a second. What about this one? It's also one. So what is the bitwise and of one and one? It's one. What is one in terms of true or false? True. So that's why the condition is true. So in, in fact, it's doing the same thing, but I would very strongly recommend you do not do this um, because uh, people will hound you over it. But uh, I still have two minutes. So um, I would always put double ampersand, but whoever asked that was it was a great question. What's that? Are true if the thing inside them uh, does not evaluate to an expression that evaluates to true or false. Uh, that's effectively testing whether score is zero or not. So. Uh, yeah, remember the example we had earlier where the statement was always true? Uh, it's by default always true if you don't have uh, something that evaluates to a Boolean. Yeah? Could you give an example of when putting one hand in would evaluate differently Uh... I can't think of one. I'll, I'll think about it, though. Uh, I, I'm sure there is one. It, it's probably something to do with, um... oh, OK. We haven't really talked about this yet, but because you asked. Remember the assignment one? So this is going to your question. It doesn't evaluate to anything. So that's, this is always true. But what if I did this? So this is effectively saying the same thing as this. Uh, okay, it has to be an integer. Fine, whatever. So this is saying, I'm going to take score and it with 70 and assign it back. So this is always true. Uh, but yeah, so let's put zero here instead. But what if I put, uh, so this is always true. Right, because it doesn't evaluate to true or false. What if I did that? Then if we put parentheses around this, this first one, then this will be always false because it's ending with zero. 
uh, it's logically ending with zero. Any last questions? Yeah. You have to put not on the front. Great, I'll see you Monday.